Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers. If you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Strain Podcast, a Southgate Media Group production, where we talk all about Guillermo del Toro's horror fantasy series, The Strain, which just wrapped up its first season on FX about two months ago. I'm your host, Blair Knight Graves, Associate Editor from Sheridings.tv, and with me today is Kyle Tremblay, the Editor-in-Chief at Sheridings.tv. You can find us on Twitter at at BlairLivesTV and at KyleLivesTV. Remember, both Kyle and Blair have an E at the end. And you can also follow this podcast's Twitter handle at at the strain pod. Hi, Kyle. How are you doing today? Blair, what are we doing here? We, I, I, I was on vacation in one of the boroughs of New York, and you have called me back to the podcast, the virtual podcast studio. And here we are. <laughs> yes. Well, today you and I are going to be discussing the differences between the television series and the books in a postmortem episode of the first season. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The book. I, I read book. one book. <laughs> As listeners of the podcast will know, I went through this whole season without having ever read anything related to The Strain. But at your uh, great urging, um, with the help of Ron Perlman, I, I read, I, I, I quote unquote read slash listened to the first of the book series of The Strain. Yes, yes. I keep, I keep misquoting and saying that you've read the books. We're here to no. talk about the book. Don't the you dare book. slander me like that. <laughs> Say that you're more productive. <laughs> yeah, no, I, listen, I read one book a year. This was my book. Next year, book two. <laughs> uh, well, this is the first podcast where we can no longer say that the major difference between you and I, our classic disclaimer, is that I have read the book and you have not. We're just the uh, same person now. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, oh my gosh. We, we have become one. <laughs> it's podcasting into a mirror. Uh, but yeah, so we want to discuss the differences between the book the first book, singular, uh, and the first season of the television show. So for our dedicated audience, you know, our lovely 5,000 plus listeners who we love and adore, um, stop listening if you don't want to hear about the book right now. No. <laughs> I don't have a nicer way to say it. <laughs> um, but you've been fairly warned, spoilers ahead, sort of not really, because they're surprisingly similar. But <laughs> Yeah, let's start um, there. Let's, let's start yeah. there that... Well, uh, my biggest surprise reading the book, having talked to you, a book reader, many, many times uh, in recorded conversations this year, uh, my my number one takeaway from the book is how, in broad terms, the TV season really followed its outline. It, yes. it it didn't diverge in the ways that I kind of thought it was going to. Right. Um, well, we should definitely discuss uh, per- any particulars that you're referring to. I mean, how would you like to do this, Kyle? You want to talk about character by character? You want to just talk from the beginning of book to the end? How do you want to do this? I don't know. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> like, you know what, you and I, we're like Dutch Velders and Vassal <laughs> Fett breaking into the Palmer building. I mean, we're, ju- we're just winging it. We're, we're improv just- here. We're winging it. I, I wrote some character names down, and I know... Well, first thing I want to talk about, I also, uh, for our listeners' edification... Um, I also listened to the Ron Perlman Red audiobook. It is a delight, by the way. He's um, amazing. He's really amazing. And he really like gives a really awesome voice to each character, which I think is pretty cool, given that you know Ron Perlman has a pretty distinctive voice. Yes. The one um, thing, he um he doesn't pronounce a frame correctly. No, he does not. <laughs> he pronounces it he, he I mean on the TV show he's called F, and yeah. you and I have been calling him F all season. Ron Perlman calls him Eve. Yes. And it is very jarring for at least the first four or five hours until you until you acclimate to it. Actually, you're 100 percent correct. It's about four or five hours every yeah. time. Eve, Eve. 
<laughs> but he's saying it in like the Ron Perlman voice. It's almost like eep. Like very strange. Very very weird. But but yeah, other yeah. than that, it is a phenomenally read book um by Ron Perlman, who really gives life to the characters and I think adds a lot to the story. Um uh just with his the way he uses his voice and the fact that he's Ron Perlman. Yes, absolutely. Uh I think he has a full grasp of the material, which is um you know, not every audiobook that I've listened to ha- can uh, can have the same claim. Um yeah. but yeah, so let's I guess let's start with like the beginning of the story. Did you feel I definitely felt at least the first time that I read the books that ev- the everything that had to do with the plane and the government was like a lot better in the books. Yes. The <laughs> the character of Oh, the character whose name I forget, but uh, F's boss at the CDC. His Not di- Jim. His, Not no, Jim. his direct supervisor. The guy um, who's just a bumbling buffoon on the show um, and watches the Secretary of Health and Human Services get lobbed out the window later in the season. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, that character is much more understandable in the book. He still has the scene later on where he, where he kind of ambushes F. Um, but just there's a there, there and this is true of all characters and we'll get to my feelings on Gus because that was a hot topic during the TV season <laughs> hot, but hot topic I felt like every character in the book and maybe this is completely understandable because books are a longer form than TV but I understood their motivations a lot better and I understood where they were coming from and they felt a lot more like real people to me I mean mm-hmm. we're talking Gus Nora um just about everyone really like every character that i thought was problematic on the tv show was smoothed over in a lot of ways by the book and that includes the government the government as an entity i think and 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 this the the overwhelming message of the tv show that we bury our heads in the sand and you know and let the apocalypse happen is certainly present in the book but but the fine point isn't put on it the way it is in the TV show. It's not, it's not overstressed the way as it, as it is in the TV show. And I feel like the TV show was much more out to prove a point while the book was just sort of, it, the book felt more human to me. It felt like people were behaving more like humans rather than like cogs in this story that's trying to have a point to it. Yeah. Um, I think that the TV show really, wanted to stress having like a ragtag team of heroes yes um than than the books did because i i felt like as we talked about a lot in in our previous podcasts and as you've now read like we go by perspective of each character in the books and i think that's a major difference um you get the perspective of pretty much everybody except for the master i think um and and that 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 can make a huge difference than just following a frame good weather. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, sort of obnoxious, bumbling idiot. <laughs> yeah. And he, I can understand why he was chosen as the hero of the show. Um, he, he at, at, for large swaths of this first book is the hero of the book, but it, it, I'm, I'm talking like 60 to 70% of it. Whereas in the TV show, he's the hero hundred percent of the time. Yeah. There, there are, there are significant portions of this book that that like you said are from other characters perspectives and and it just it, it provides a nice balance and it it um allows us to to better understand them like the all the material about um the the uh, uh f- four original victims from the plane mm-hmm. it, i feel like is so much more fleshed out in the book oh my gosh and and is so it it occurs in such a more logical sequence where I mean, like, like my biggest concern with the TV show, probably if you had to, if you had to narrow it down to one, was the 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 timeline being so troublesome, yeah, and just the the, the like who knows what when why isn't anyone panicking why is this stuff happening and that is largely present in the book but it's smoothed over it it the book feels very methodical in that way like we're just going you know you know just an hour at a time one step to the next we're jumping around perspective wise and i never had the sense in the book the same way that i did on the tv show that something is really not adding up with the way people are reacting like the t- i think just the the way the book sort of churns through the material you kind of lose track of how the world should be reacting. Like, you don't feel like that's a necessary compo- a component to see the way that you did in the TV show. So you brought up, a, 
I agree. Uh, but you brought up a good point specifically about the original four um, victims. Yeah. Um, was there any that stood out to you in particular? Would you say all four? I, I mean, all oh. four were obviously much stronger, but was there any particular story that stood out to you? Definitely Anne Marie. Um, she was right? a victim. It was what was her husband's name? The victim? Ansel. Ansel. Anne Marie and Ansel. Um, yeah. That was a thousand times better in the book. Right. That that scene was ludicrous and borderline offensive on the TV show. Her portrayal, and in the book, you you. I mean, she's clearly portrayed as like a woman who is like solely reliant on a man, but she's also portrayed as having a, a, a mental issue, which yeah, is... She's a, she's a mental disability. She has like, a mental disability, which, which is made clear in the book and not made clear on the TV show, which is the difference right. between being offensive and not offensive. Right. <laughs> on the TV show, you think, oh no, like she's this horrible, stereotypical woman. And on the book, you're like, oh no, she is someone who has developed, who has a mental disability and who relies on her husband because, because of that disability. And you just have this better perspective and the way she kills herself is so much more dramatic in the book mm -hmm. um you know in the tv show they find her hanging in the book they find her having slit her wrist with a jagged shard of glass mm -hmm. and they, that just it's a it's a little detail but it just it, it gives you a sense of how desperate she was like like the book makes clear and, and i want to talk about this also the book is very clinical and it has a lot of digressions to clinical things. And just the explanation that, like, only 5% of wrist-slitting cases result in death because it is very hard to slit your wrist and kill yourself. It's You only get one shot at it, and they went through all these things. And it's like, she slit very deep. And it's like, ooh. Right. That's, like, but that, that, like, tells me about, like, her state of mind better than the 20 minutes of screen time she got on TV ever did. Yeah, and I mean... Her character, it's like in retrospect, I always talk, we always talk about how it should never be in retrospect, but like in the TV show, like her changing her shirt and her having all her religious symbols yeah. and like all these paranoid things, all these things that are supposed to be representation of her desperation before she offs herself, which is a very cold way of saying it because it is, it's more than that. It's definitely, yeah. but it's, it's a methodical desperation. Um, it seems silly it seems ludicrous you're right it's, it's right. so much that she is like the housewife who's just mad that her husband isn't paying attention to her instead of a woman who is very very mentally ill right like physically incapable of leaving her own home she's so like uh so incapable of it with her mental blocks um and then you know and then her only source of help you know disappears and locks himself in a um locks himself in a shed. <laughs> yeah, turns into a monster, as she sees. <laughs> right, which is her biggest fear, is people becoming monsters. Uh, and I also think, like, the material with the dog was pretty... The dogs in the book was so much... Like, when you're having Ansel's perspective of him yes. going... Like, because that, that... It's very emotional in the TV show, too, to the degree that it could be. But in the books, like, you get his desperation, too. His desire not to hurt his family and therefore hurt his dog. Right. Yeah. Like that. That story was a tragedy in the books. It was. Yes. It was. It was like a. It was like a digression to a tragic play in yes. the books. That that this little like two person play with a with a cameo from whatever the book equivalent of nosy na nosy neighbor Trip Taylor was. Our hero. Uh, our hero. <laughs> the, the mascot of this podcast. Um, <laughs> but but it was really like a two person play that played out and and. It played out over the course of, of I don't know how many pages because I was just listening, but it, it it was allowed a lot of room to breathe, and it was very sad, and there was a sort of rising, um, dread. Like you know from the start it's going to go badly, but then like he's you know at one point he's drinking the dog's neck, and then you know she and returns, and it just yeah. It, yeah it was just it was just like a little a little play that occurred in the middle of it in a way that it never was in the TV show. In the TV yeah. show, it was just like a couple scenes mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, F and, and uh, everyone, Abe arrive and are, are like CSI, but you know, it, it just, the book, it felt so much more substantial. Um, it, you've, you've, you understood the gravity of it. You understood the tragedy. Right. Yes. Um, in, in, in the TV show, it is, Almost an afterthought. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, that's I think that's the nature of the beast in a lot of ways. That's just what books are versus TV shows. TV, you know, they – even though the book itself was – the the audiobook was like, what, 14 hours, 13 hours? It's quite long, yeah. And the TV show was 13 hours? So they actually had the <laughs> same amount of time to tell the story, which is weird. <laughs> but obviously it's harder to show it. And, and one thing, just pivoting a bit, just in general about the book, this is an – an extraordinarily heavy on narration book. This is not yes. a dialogue book. No. And you can 
immediately see the problems um, with the TV show in that this book does not have a lot of dialogue in it. This is this book has just long, long stretches where nobody is talking, where we are just being told a story. And mm-hmm. none of that translates to TV because <laughs> in TV, <laughs> everyone has to be talking. The show yeah. doesn't have a narrator, right? There's no narrator on the show. There's no one to read backstories. And so every scene that is narrated in the book has to be has to be infused with dialogue in the TV show. And, and you and I talked about a lot during the season how shaky the dialogue was. And I, I think yeah. that that was because they're trying to turn all of this really interesting narration into, into some way to convey the important information – but without any source material, because you you don't have any you don't you've got it. That's why characters like Dutch Velders are invented because you can't explain the internet thing. You have to show the internet thing. So Dutch Velders shows up, you know. And and I think that that a lot of the struggles with the TV show were inventing this dialogue that the book just did not have. And I wanted to. That's a great pivot to a point that I wanted to make. Uh-huh. Actually, pivot to pivot to pivot, oh. uh, which uh, was I forgot. The Icarus isn't in the first book. Yes. <laughs> Not present. No, and it's interesting that I would forget that. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's pretty big it, detail. But he kind of served, I think, that he served very much the role that the show needed because he was the exposition. Yes. He was what would have been the narration. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to pivot off your pivot off my pivot. <laughs> and uh, this is called the Pivot Podcast, by the way. Welcome. <laughs> uh, but but I... I that was to me one of the TV show's great successes over the book is that I think the Iker's character brought something to the TV show that was not present in the book. That a sort of dark levity to it. The book has a couple moments that are kind of funny, a couple comments, but it's it's overall a very serious and very methodical book. Yes, um, that that isn't nearly as funny in the books. As no, I mean, that is still the funniest of all the characters. Yeah, but he but is he's, he is not a comic character in the book. No. He's, he's just a rat catcher. He's what you would imagine a city a veteran city rat catcher who's kind of seen it all is in the TV shows. As I've said, he is Nicolas Cage in an action movie. <laughs> he's he's delivering one liners. He's blowing up vampires. I mean, he's doing everything. Like he he is not that in the book. Um, but but adding Icarus, I think was was. A, a genius edition by the TV show, um, a, a frankly edition that probably saved the TV show. Yes. Because um, like you said, he serves a very functional purpose of the master can't really talk that much just because he's kind of, you kind of got to dole him out in small doses. <laughs> yeah. You got to, you got to save him for when it's good and <laughs> yes. quote unquote when it's good. <laughs> right. So, so Iker is sort of, sort of stepping in as, as a surrogate villain who can actually talk to Abe and talk to F and, and interact with Jim and Gus and like just sort of going from place to place and being the sounding board for the exposition um, was such a crucial decision by the show. I don't know how it would have done it without a character like that. And, Mm -hmm. and like you said, not present in the book, in the first book at all. Yeah. Um, Which, which was very interesting. Yes. Um, So you brought up Jim Kent. Yeah. Um, Compare contrast. Um, I've, forgot how not sympathetic he is in the books yeah he's uh, yeah he's pretty much straight up evil he's a straight up bad guy he's just why, a bad guy why was he not a straight up bad guy in the show it's a much better character <clears throat> it, yeah because he's sam campy <laughs> yeah, right. but it's so much more interesting to me that 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 moment i i mean just thinking back to the book one of the one of the probably top 10 moments for me is when F, Abe, and Nora are um, after Jim has like escaped the hospital, and they're at um, his apartment with his uh, with his wife, and they notice her calling the phone, and she don't, she reveals that she's in on it, that she's a mm-hmm. bad guy. I forget the mm-hmm. line exactly, but she's like, "You'll never stop it in time." I was like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> like, like on the show, she's just like this awful cancer-stricken person who you should feel sympathy for, but whose dialogue is so severe you hate her. Like, <laughs> which is, you, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you on that thought, but it just occurred to me: like, does the show have a much harder time with women than the books did? Uh, by a degree of a million. <laughs> uh, first of all, Nora's mom not not present in the books. Not in the first book. She's in the second book. Oh God, why? 
Now, no, no. now you've depressed me because I thought <laughs> I thought the books were smartly avoided that awful. No, because I because remember in the in the early episode of the podcast I was like and Nora's mom and then I was like oh oops I shouldn't have said that because we <laughs> hadn't met her yet. Um, but, but it's she's not much not different. in this book and yeah. it makes both the story in general and Nora a lot better because yeah. she's not bailing on the zombie apocalypse, calling a timeout to take care of her mom for the most crucial day, like. Mm-hmm. It, I that, that is Kelly. that did not need to exist. No, yeah. and Kelly is better. It, certainly, and well, <laughs> Kelly and Zach are better because they are a lot less present in the books. <laughs> the, the, but when Kelly is present, it's much more meaningful. Oh, sure. Uh, well, like and, every character, she's be- she's easier to understand in the books. Mm-hmm. You, you you get her motivation, and she's a lot more um more like a real person. Yes. But the first like half of this book, she's in one scene, and yeah. Zach is in one scene. Like, mm-hmm. the entire first four episodes of The Strain are devoted to them and F. And the book, it, it, they have one scene, and then it's like eight hours before you visit them again. Yeah. And that, uh, I found that very nice, because, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, and it's quite effective, because you have the drama of he does have all the parenting things all at the beginning, like the, what were you so upset about? The, uh, the, the guardianship meetings, or custody, the custody yes. meetings. Like, that was, that, that was is, the one scene. Right. It's still in the beginning. And then you get like, you'll get a couple text messages from either, like F will receive text messages from them throughout the beginning of the book. And then, um, you do all the analytical stuff and we learn everything that we need to know about what's about to happen so that everything that does happen is so meaningful. Yes. Instead of us coming back to them and she's yes. having a fight with Sears Matt. <laughs> and, right. Uh, and it, it's so much more meaningful when they do come back because they do come back uh, and they're quite present in the second half of the book. Yes. Um, and, but when they're present, it is meaningful because he has discovered, F has discovered, F and the team have discovered everything that is going to happen and everything that is very, very wrong. And he immediately goes, oh, I need to protect the people I love now that I have done my job, as opposed to this constant struggle in the television show where it's like, oh, I really need to do my job, but you're the people I love. Yes. It's more of, I did my job, and now I must save the people I love. And that's such a crucial difference. Would you agree? Like, that that's, it's a small difference. I wouldn't necessarily call it small, but, like, it's a small, different way of describing it. But, like, you do your job to realize that you need to protect your family instead of like your family is in the way of you doing your job. No, I, I think you, I think you hit it on the head. I think that that's yeah. the the biggest difference in terms of the characters because in the TV show it's all happening simultaneously. Like you said, yeah. it's it's all the apocalypse is happening, but the F and family story is happening. F is sleeping with Nora in the bed of yeah, I, like all of that stuff is happening as the most crucial days occur. And in the book, we just take a time out from all that stuff. The, the book just gets down, has a, such a large section where it's just down to business. And, and there were just no, there, there were so many few, like you never reading the book, you never think like, Oh, why aren't they doing this? Like it all, it all seems very natural. And like the progression is, is so much more natural in the book. Whereas in the show, that was my dominant thought in like episode four. Like, why aren't they addressing this? Right. <laughs> you know? And like, why are they, why are they sleeping? Why are, why are F and Nora sleeping together? Why is all this happening? Like at this present time and the book, those questions just never come up. Like you just feel like everything that's happening. One thing leads to another. You, 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 you just don't, you understand why the stuff that is happening is happening. Um, to to a much greater degree than in the TV show. So then we found that there was the misstep of the television show really struggles to write women. Yeah. Um, it struggles to know the difference between working to love and and then love being in the way of work. Um, and it also the big difference is just that honestly it's the time frame and just the way that the disease works and the way that people react to an epidemic. Like, the government, we talked about that, too. Yeah. Um, like, so, what What could, I mean, it's not our job to fix the show, but what could they have done? I mean, obviously, they had this great source material, which is, you can now see why in some podcasts I was getting upset. Um, well, because, hold blah. on. I know where you're going. Okay, ask your question. No, I just, what, I'm just wondering, like, what can they do in season two to address these issues? Obviously, it's a different story, but like, if these are issues that they have, then 
I I think they asked themselves that question before they started writing the script for the TV show, mm. um, because there are issues with the book, and yeah. there are issues that need to be addressed for a TV show. Um, the the government every every individual member of the government is behaving in a more human way in the book, but at the same time, at one point the government doctors security footage to make it look like F uh, is guilty of murdering the pilot. Yes. At that point, the, the, the raw footage that they have, we know from what the doctor footage is, the raw footage that they have would have shown that the pilot is some kind of monster creature. And, and there's, there, there, oh, like, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is the government, this, the, the book of this, the book, doesn't even make attempts to address the fact that nobody is communicating by the internet. There is no Dutch Velder's character. There is no internet outage. People are using the internet constantly in the book, and yet there is no mass communication happening, which is a, a not a plot hole. That is a plot Grand Canyon. You cannot. <laughs> this story cannot occur if the internet exists. The entire crux of the story is dead. Dead on arrival. It, it, the book. It, the book is nonsensical in that way. The 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 backbone of everything regarding the public in this book is is based in like 1992 before the internet existed. Mm -hmm. Like this, the book cannot happen with the internet existing because everyone would know people would people would have their phones out and the book shows a profound lack of understanding about how people behave in this in the same not in the same way but in a similar vein that the show does like at one point um uh uh the scene where where the uh, early on the vampires rampaging through like times square and gus and felix like chase him and he starts like getting sort of violent with people and so Felix and Gus uh attack him and he bites Fe or he, uh, he 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 gets Felix at that point um and then Gus stabs him and his head is run over by oncoming traffic then the police show up and they charge Gus with the crime and the book describes that the entire crowd had left at that point the entire crowd fl fled when there is a fender bender on the side of the road people rubberneck to see it if yeah. there is a monster creature in Times Square whose head gets run over by a car, a thousand people are going to be around that scene. People aren't right. going to leave. People are going to come to that scene because that is how people behave. And yes. the same thing is true of just the, the assumptions that the show makes about the – about that the book makes, sorry, about the internet. It doesn't even address it. There's there's no talk about the internet in this except to say like when Zach accesses it and no one ever has any problems with it. And if the internet exists in, in 2009 or whenever this was written, it did exist and did. YouTube was there. None of this could happen. None of, none of the none of the plot points could happen. Like like the word would be out within six hours. The the plane crash itself, like like the survivors, we saw what happened to the Ebola nurse. The Ebola nurse is followed by cameras constantly, and she just has Ebola, which is barely communicable. This is right. 200 people on a plane dying, and the survivors defy quarantine and leave. They would have cameras in their face 24-7. They would be on yeah. every news, every TV channel, and and that is simply unaddressed in the books. And yeah. so the TV show said, "Oh, we gotta address that. Like we gotta, yeah. we can't have a TV show where that is the case. People right. are gonna notice it." And so they tried to address it, and my point is, they failed. That's they that's did. my long run. That the book has these massive gaping plot holes that it doesn't even bother to address, and it's kind of fine because it's a book and you're not seeing it. You're just sort of, you know, like you're just going from A to B to C to D, and you're never like, you know, you, it, it never addresses it. But like the TV show had to. You're seeing it right. on TV, and uh, and the TV show just wasn't effective in the way it addressed it. It's 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 funny because you and I, any time that Chuck Hogan wrote an episode of The Strain, you and I would talk about how he just doesn't seem to understand human behavior at all. Like yeah. there were there are some writers on the t TV show. Um, the woman who wrote episode three and I think episode ten, maybe six. Um, like th there are some writers that do understand human behavior, and those episodes are very very strong. Yeah. But then you get episodes written by Chuck Hogan, who also wrote the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, Guillermo Guillermo del Toro. It was Guillermo del Toro's story, but. 
Chuck Hogan did all the heavy lifting with the, yes. the, the actual pros. Um, it, it might be a thing where he doesn't actually, maybe he doesn't interact with people that much because he's a writer. Certainly not uh, young people because no, every true. young person in this book talks like they talks like a 1950s teenager. <laughs> Like, we, well, we should. We, this is a perfect opportunity for us to talk about Gus yeah. because I think Gus's dialogue oh, in the book, books is not much better than it is in the TV no, show. It's, it's but worse. He, it's worse. But, but it's, he's it's atrocious. He, he's it's clearly written by somebody who has no idea. Yeah, by a white guy in his forties. It's a white guy in his forties. It's, it's a white guy in his forties yeah, trying to write a twenty-year-old uh, Mexican character, an eighteen-year-old Mexican, an 18-year-old, character. and failing to a degree that is laughably spectacular. <laughs> I mean, yeah. every every single line of dialogue that Gus has in the books is absolutely hilariously ludicrous. Um, it, it it is it is one of the worst written characters I've ever seen. But but he has like five lines of dialogue, <laughs> so it's not that bad. <laughs> but he says essay in every single one. Oh god, of no, no, it's it's yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, he does, and he yeah. the way he mixes English and Spanish is so like oh <laughs> like no. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't how people talk. This isn't how real people talk. No, but, uh, no, but he's such a he's such a better character in the book. You he hated is. you hated him in the TV show. I hate is strong. I didn't. You, I didn't. You intently dislike. Sure, I didn't like him in the TV show, and I think in the books, he's he's. First of all, the focus on his mother is a lot less. He clearly mm-hmm. loves his mother, but it's not his reason for existence. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just, you know, because we only, you know, in the books you get entire chapters about him. Whereas in the TV show, we see him for like five minutes an episode. And for like, I mean, Gus's introduction was like, like his first three scenes are with his mother and his brother. And then his next scene is stealing a car. And it's like, why is, why is this character on my screen? In the books, no car, no car stealing at all. No, no, Very no, smart. no guy from the wire. No, Marlo doesn't show up. He's still in Baltimore. Um, and and the character just gets down to business about a thousand times quicker. Like you, you right from the get go, you understand Gus's purpose in the books. Like, like I, I in, in both the TV show and the books, he goes through the whole thing where he's moving the uh, moving the uh, the, the coffin, cab- the, cabinet. the cabinet. Yeah, the cabinet. Some people call it a coffin, by the way. It's not universally called the cabinet. Abe calls okay. it a coffin, doesn't he? No, it's a cabinet. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just projecting. Um, <laughs> but uh, he moves the cabinet uh, in both shows. But in the, then in the TV show, he has like five episodes where, he's, where he has no point whatsoever, which is why I started disliking him, because I just felt like that character has no point. In the, TV, in the book, he just gets right down to business. He has an awesome scene where after Felix has been infected, where he's in jail with Abe, and Abe explains to him what's happening, and mm-hmm. he doesn't immediately discount him like he's crazy, which I thought was an awesome choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just you, you, you get him a lot more. Like, like he just, I, I understood his place in the story in the book in a way that I didn't in the TV show until the very last episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, that he's, I, I was, I knew that I loved Gus, but re-listening to redoing the story of the book, I, I feel the same way. Like his purpose was much stronger, and um, I also felt his relationship with Felix was better. Um, and even though Chuck Hogan struggled to write them, um, he still seemed like a kid, but he also seemed like, like he, he did act like a kid. He got a bunch of yes. money for delivering the cabinet and his first thought was to go get some booze and cigarettes, right? Like, right. and to party with his friend and that he was going to blow all that money and he could pay it on rent, which unlike in the TV show, he goes and he pays it on rent, uh, in the books. He's like, no, I'm just going to go and party hard. And even when he gets arrested for, like, yeah, I agree with the people scattering. That's not realistic human behavior. But it makes so much more sense that the cops would take him in because it looked like he knocked a guy into the street who got his head, like, run over than the cops nabbing him just because he's, like, a Mexican guy right running through the streets like he is in the TV show. Yeah. Um, like, the, the world is just functionally better around him. Whereas in in the books it was you're, you or in the TV show you were very right about like he's just he's the thug with a heart of gold and like right. they pre- press that so much so much so much and then they also just pressed that it was like oh he's just a Mexican guy who was you know at the wrong place in the wrong time and got arrested in the TV show as opposed to like oh something really bad happened and the police had every right to arrest and, him and yeah <laughs> he was he um, again in the TV show he he has the initial action where he's you know he's been uh, uh, he, he paid by Ikers to to move the cabinet. And then, what is his arc? Someone explain to me what his arc is, because I don't understand even a little bit. 
like I, like what what's what's A, what's B, what's C with Gus? Because I know that it ends with him getting in both in both the book and the TV show. It ends with him getting recruited by the uh, the group of of vampire assassins, the 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 vampire squad. Um, so it ends in the same spot, but in the TV show, there's no arc. Like it's just like scattered scenes that don't yeah. do anything to develop his character, uh, and that don't don't lead anywhere. Because that vampire thing, the 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 only relevant fact to that is that his mother is infected, like which yeah. happens so late in the TV show. Um, and yeah, it just I I just never I never questioned the purpose of the character in the book the way that I did in the TV show. It seemed it seemed a lot. It just seemed more. He seemed more germane to the story. Like he just, yeah. he's just like, oh, of course he's there. Like I never questioned it. Whereas the TV show, like by episode four, it's like I don't understand what he's. Why is he on right. my screen right now? Why is he right. stealing a car? Um. Okay. So we've got Gus. Then we you, good pivot. Just the pivot podcast. Uh. So we got the ancient vampires, which I think is pretty much almost exactly the same. Yes. Um. But then the master. Uh, yeah, the- I wish I-, I I wish I had read the book first so that every time I, he was talking, I didn't think he was some kind of frog clown. <laughs> that would be great, right? Because because like uh, my 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 mental vision of him now is is forever etched as this sort of CGI creature that kind of looks like he's he's like, like the like the frog pilot in Star Fox. Like <laughs> that's, so that's kind of my my impression of him. So it was hard uh. it was hard to disassociate that. Um, but there's a really awesome scene in the books where he um, uh, meets uh, uh, Palmer on his balcony and like brings the vampire army with him, mm-hmm. kind of. And like the army like is all just standing there, like sort of worshiping him, and is like really like dramatic and awesome. That for some reason didn't occur in the TV show. I don't know why. <laughs> Would have been a cool scene <laughs> because the show needed to make him laughable. I mean, like they, because like I mean, first of all. In in the in the book, he is he. They explain that the vampires can sort of move bodies. Um, that they don't right. I'm that right he about can, that. He can take different forms. That he can yes. He, he, they, he's been in the same one, uh, Yusuf, uh, which is which the book really interestingly opens with this anecdote of of Yusuf. Sa- Sargev, something I don't know how to pronounce his yeah, name, so, but yeah. this, this giant who who went into a cave and came back with the master inhabiting him, and yeah. and he's been in that form ever since. Yeah, but it's so cool, like yes. to Ultra to cool. learn that story, yes, and to learn about how he got that really and how he got the weird body, and like there's even even though it's a book, there's a sound, the pick pick pick, yeah. that you that you that like will like that you'll associate now if you ever hear like. Tick, tick, you might think, oh, that reminds me of the strain. Yeah. Um, like it, it's so visceral, it's so well described, and it's it's so relatable, even though not because I'm not a giant living in Eastern <laughs> Europe. But like it's so it's so human. It's such a human description of how the master came to be in his current form, and like how he came to be this terrifying mass, and the rest of the vampires don't get to do that, and. And how, and then the way that he interacts with everybody in that body, and that that's a story that Abraham knew his entire life yes. that he learned as a child. Like it connects so many pieces, and and like yes, they in the, the TV show they do connect. You know the concentration camp story, which does you know do all the connecting the pieces, but it's so it's so much more visceral. I, I that's the only word I really have for it, but it's so much more visceral the way that the master is portrayed in the books and he he's not silly no not at all he's terrifying he, he's also uh, if i think what he is is he's ground in ground in a history like in yeah. a way that he's not in the tv show he just kind of pops up yeah and it's like oh well the master's here he's the bad guy and right. uh and in the books i i for the life of me will never understand why the first scene of the tv show wasn't it didn't open with yusuf the giant um uh exploring a cave like a little like two minute scene and then like a fade away to abraham's grandmother or mother telling him that story like mm-hmm. young and she says like young abraham like and he's like clearly listening and then like you know then you do the credits and then the first scene is the plain scene but like and then like the first time we saw the master he would be like a deformed version of the yusuf that we saw in that first scene Right, yeah. like, how cool would that be to have that character have a history to him? Like, and it, it, it I was just fascinated by that. Um, 
Well, yeah. And, and also just like think about the Guillermo del Toro aesthetic. If you've seen the opening sequence to The Hobbit and if you've seen the opening sequence to the Hellboy films, then you know that um, you know that Guillermo del Toro is a master at having old people tell children scary stories. Yes. Like that he does a really like phenomenal job with that visual and that there's so many different ways that he could have gone with that and made that terrifying and you're right and to to open it with the plane i understand you want to have that big moment it's got the social media impact like people are going to talk about it all that stuff but like the show could have been quieter and, and and more terrifying because it was quieter if it had begun that way instead of just immediately jumping in and trying to be loud if that makes yes. sense no i i, I think so and and that was a a continual problem for the show which is trying to create these big moments and in a lot of cases, there were moments that didn't exist in the book. And the show had had some success, um, like the uh, the convenience store scene, um, mm-hmm. the the episode, the bottle episode that we love so much. I forget its name now. Then is it Creatures of the Night? Creatures of the Night. Creatures okay. of the Night um, doesn't occur in this book. I don't know if it occurs in future books or not, but. Um, that's just not something that happens, and I feel like it was the best part of the TV season. And, yeah, was- but there were a lot of other moments where they tried to put an exclamation point on a sentence, and it didn't work. Yeah. And I, I just big picture, having having read this book or listened to it or whatever you want to say, I was struck by how um, how slow it was, and I don't mean that as a criticism. I I mean this was not for large portions a um an action book in the way that the tv show is kind of an action show like the tv show has like every episode there's like some kind of mission that they have to go on you know they're they're investigating something and there's going to be vampires and they're going to get killed and this book after the after the opening and before the sort of closing before like the 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 closing events uh go into motion is is uh, the word I keep using is is uh, methodical. It's a very very methodical book and very deliberate. It, the pacing of this book is so deliberate and it's so it's so um narrative heavy and so it, uh, it, it, any chance anything it introduces it will take a digression to explain the backstory of that. Whether it's medical procedures, whether it's minor characters, there, there's in the very opening scene the character of um Jimmy the Bishop is introduced, who's a character who has no significance beyond that first plane scene. But we have, like, what I would guess is, like, a five or six paragraph backstory for that character, explaining who he is, what his significance is, what his relationship with his co-workers is, and how he interacts with the world. And it's just, like, he's just the flight controller. He becomes irrelevant to the story after chapter one. But this book, the book takes its time in a way that I found very surprising. Um... So that, that that really struck me. Do you think that the TV show would have been successful if it had taken its time in that way? I, I, calling this TV show successful is a stretch for me. The current iteration of the TV show. I don't oh, know. That's right. I yeah, don't I think didn't... the TV show was successful. I think it may have had more success if it had trusted the audience a little more to bear with that kind of material. Yeah. Because I think I think that, honestly, the show would have functioned better as horror had it been slower paced. Because I think that, that the the... Just the the constant sort of stream of of missions and stuff really detracted from any kind of like atmospheric horror because it was like let's get this crew together and let's go on quests and that yeah. that's a tough environment for a horror film they really just had to rely on sort of cool visual stuff but in terms of like creating any like horrific situations that that were like scary not because there were scary vampires all around them but because you know because of just the nature of the situation um i think the tv show sort of punted on that because it wanted it it, it didn't trust the audience to stick with that kind of stuff and is that we know what fx delivers is that enough is that having to do with the network that it's on is that solely the show created because i mean we all know that networks will send material back and they'll say no you need to make it funnier you need to make it scarier or more action-packed does it just feel like does it feel like overly FXy, or does it feel like maybe just not a strong production team? Because I mentioned before, like th- there are some writers on that staff that are freshman writers, and th- yes. that's not to say that's not to say that like they shouldn't be given their chance. But 
like the, if if it's their first episode of television that they're ever writing, yeah, you you, you can see it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so I. I think that that might be part of it. I I wouldn't discount that because shows like Justified um, and uh, and FX's other shows, that their FX has a strong episodic element to all of its drama. It's not like HBO or Showtime, which will um will definitely commit to to to, ser- to purely serial stories and have like I just think about some of the episodes of Dexter where nothing happened, or think about some of the the episodes of uh, of Game of Thrones. You know, like th- those networks definitely have a commitment to tell season long stories, often at the expense of episode long stories that FX does not have. FX every episode of an FX show, um, I think there's a mandate to make it interesting, which I think in a lot of cases is admirable. Um, and I certainly wouldn't have wanted uninteresting episodes of The Strain. I'm just wondering if they could have if they could have done it in in a way that more matched the tone of the book because this book is very like I would say buttoned down almost like there's a there's a and maybe maybe I'm just being swayed by by the magnificence of Ron Perlman's reading but there there's just a sort of um a, a, a clinical uh, nature of of the book that wasn't present in the TV show the TV show was kind of manic like yeah. like there's a, there's a lot of manic stuff happening in the TV show and the book just felt very like we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to like just everyone seemed to know what they're doing a little better in the book mm-hmm. um and, and it just I, d- I never got that with the TV show. The TV show, it's like a lot of times, was just a bunch of buffoons <laughs> trying their best. And the book, the book, I don't think ever felt like that. No. Do you? Is there anything that you think that the the TV show did better than the book? Well, the introduction of Eichhorst. Yeah. Um, we already well, talked yes. about. And I talked <laughs> about creatures of the night. Those were my big two. That yeah. cre- the creatures of the night thing was awesome, and uh, Eichhorst as a character was the standout of the TV season, which is a real accomplishment because he wasn't present in the book. So that was yes. a, a great, uh, a, a, just a, a home run for, mm-hmm. for the show. Um, other than that, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm going to say I got two. Uh, yeah. The, just, I, and, and again, it's it's tough. I mean, my, my comparison is Game of Thrones because that's a, a the only other show where I have read the books and watched the TV show. Mm-hmm. And to me... This is a really controversial statement. Um, I think the TV show Game of Thrones is better than the book series. I think oh, yeah. I think the TV show. Uh, I think the book is the books are very good. The Song of Ice and Fire books are very good, and I enjoy them quite a bit. I think the TV show, the acting on those show uh, on that show is so like top notch. The way the story is told is so smart. And so savvy, and so conscious of pace, but also not being a slave to pace the way that that the strain was, where it just felt like it kept having to throw logs in the fire. Game of Thrones has just infinite confidence to slow down and to trust the audience and to do bottle episodes and to f- focus on characters that you might not think it would focus on. Mm-hmm. And um, I it just comparing the two, I mean, Game of Thrones is a better book and a better TV show, but at the same time, I think the 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 strain is a good book and a struggling TV show, <laughs> and I I just think the TV show hopefully will, with an off season, um, come back with with a better idea of how to effectively capitalize on what made the book good. Yeah. Do you think that the second season has a chance at being better, or do you think? Yeah. yeah? Always, always. I, I think. I mean, I like the cast, you know, and that's a big thing. Um, I think. The TV show does best with action, and that's the sort of the that's the bet it's made. So that's the bet it's going to have to lie in now. I don't think I don't think the TV show is suddenly going to become, you know, slower paced. That would be <laughs> absurd based on just where it's been so far. So I think it's just got to roll with it and become an action show, and um, and based on where it seems like the story is going, that would sort of make sense. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. I think it already. It, I think I think what the strain did is it it, it blew its chance to be a serious premium cable drama the way you know in that conversation with game of thrones the way that game of thrones is very impressively as a sort of fantasy show yeah got it into the conversation but the strain was never going to be competing with game of thrones it was gonna it was gonna be competing with the walking dead Ooh, Uh, so glad you brought it up (laughs) uh like that was 
the competitor. And I think one thing I wanted to say about FX is the FX is, is known for having Sons of Anarchy and Justified as being excellent. Uh, and the Americans as being excellent dramas that, you know, but the, then it also has like the bridge. Um, so which, it, got, which got better before it got canceled. It figured it yeah. out this season. Oh, I didn't know it got canceled. Yeah. Um, but like they, they, they want, and they strive for this event television. Yes. Um, and I think that that is a man and, and, you know, for very unique television. And I think that that is something that does work for them. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think that it put a lot ha having us just having re you know, ha read the books, listen to the books, whatever, whatever. Um, put a lot of pressure. I, I, I guess after listening, listening to the book again, I thought that probably a lot of the pressure came from FX based on what I've seen, what else yeah. I've seen FX. It's hard. It's um, hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to judge that. Well, because if you had put it on Showtime, you brought up Dexter before. Dexter's freshman season is some of the best television to ever be created. Yes. Um, obviously the rest of the show of Dexter was not so good, but like, um, the first season was phenomenal television. And if, you know, if a team, and a network like Showtime had picked it up. Like Showtime also has Masters of Sex, which is excellent and mm -hmm. slow. Um, yes. it, 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 I think that there is a real. It, it's really important to think about the network that it's on. So with FX trying to going back to the Walking Dead point, with FX trying to be a major competitor of AMC, they're trying to constantly go for dramatic, high quality television that also is event television and is television that people have to tune in for the week that it comes on and. I think that it put a lot of undue, to use the word, it put a lot of undue strain on uh, on the strain <laughs> that 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 kind of made them make some some take some bad steps. That's a fair point, but it is also a point uh, based on the assumption that the people behind the strain wanted to make the kind of show you're talking about, as in they yeah. wanted to make a slow drama. And I don't I don't have I based on what I saw in that first season. And the problems, not just with the pacing, but with the dialogue, with the characterization, with with the timeline of the show, which is the, with like basic problems like the editing, the way that the scenes were, were pieced together. Like, I, I, I don't think there's any reason to believe that the people behind the scenes on the strain were capable of making the kind of premium drama that I was kind of hoping the show would be. Mm -hmm. um, network restraints or not. Like, this show, you know, like, HBO is the network that I would have thought of, because Showtime would have definitely given it the creative freedom to be slow, but it also would have made it last ten seasons, because every Showtime show goes nine or ten seasons, and that would be terrible for this, because it would just stagnate in the middle, just like every other Showtime show. Um, I was thinking HBO would be the ideal network for The Strain, but then HBO has a, a show near and dear to your heart, True Blood, which is the kind of manic and and madcap show that the strain sort of got closer to than the sort of um slow boiling premium drama like game of thrones and so it's like right. just because you're on a network that permits you to be slow and 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 sort of smart um doesn't mean you will be slow and smart and right. so i i i have no sense that the that like the the creators and writers of the strain are like being restrained by FX in any way. No, I don't no have any sense of that. No, I think probably my biggest sense is that I know that FX is is trying to battle AMC now. Like they are they're yeah. they're they're coming at them, and um, I think just the shows that they have picked and the shows that they have, and they're they're trying they're trying to beat The Walking Dead, and they failed to beat The Walking Dead so far. By, but yeah. So far, by a long shot. I mean, yeah. The Walking Dead, uh, its first season did not... I mean, it had a lot of viewers, but it didn't have nearly as many viewers as it has tuning no. in every week it's, now. Well, now it's the biggest biggest thing on television. Yeah. Um, um, I want to so talk about The Walking Dead. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Wanna... Well, first of all, um, hopefully this podcast is posted and you are listening to it before or on Saturday, November 8th, because yeah. we are hosting a Walking Dead binge on Twitter. And Blair and I will both be participating. Um, do you want to talk about it, Blair? Yeah. Uh, so every month-ish, um, our website hosts TV binges. Uh, and the, we'll be watching seven straight episodes of The Walking Dead that have been picked by my social media team. I'm the, the associate editor at Sheridings.tv, but I'm also the director of social media. And I run the TV binges team uh, with the assistance of Kyle who uh, has watched much more Walking Dead than I have. Mm -hmm. um, we picked some really strong episodes. I think everybody will really like it. It starts at noon uh, on 
Saturday, November 8th, uh, noon my time. So 1 p.m. Eastern time. Go from that. Don't go from my time. Go 1, yes. 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, starting with the pilot episode. Uh, and if you want to find out more information, you can go to bit.ly, bit.ly, I don't know how people say that, bit.ly slash TWD binge. Again, that is bit.ly slash or forward slash TWD binge and we hope to see you there you can tweet at us uh, you can tweet at myself or Kyle at Blair Lives TV at Kyle Loves TV or uh, you can also tweet at at TV binges which is the, uh, the uh, our account that will be running that and we have we have paired up with uh, the Walking Dead fan site so big shout out to them they're very cool people um, they will be helping us host the activities yes. <laughs> so. and so <laughs> now we get to the point where I know at least one listener, uh, our good friend uh, Joanne, emailed about um, and wondering about, um, which is my thoughts on The Walking Dead. <laughs> <laughs> because Take it away, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in, in, in I would say every episode of The Strain Podcast this season, I made some joke at The Walking Dead's expense. Um, I would say that's probably a fair statement. Uh, I, at, at points, made fun of The Walking Dead. I don't think I was I was ever coy about the fact that I have not liked The Walking Dead for uh, since season two, which I thought was one of the worst seasons I've ever seen of television. Um, and uh, I'm I'm very hard on the show, and I reviewed the show for a while and gave it bad reviews, and then stopped reviewing it. Um, so I so all that to say, uh, listeners know that I have a troubled history with The Walking Dead. Um, and so, you know, The Strain aired over the summer, and we are currently now in the middle of The Walking Dead's uh, season that's airing. Is it really in the middle of it already? Uh, approaching the middle. Is Real it a 24-episode or 12? I don't know. <laughs> don't, ask, don't ask me to know extra things about The Walking Dead. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. um, what struck me right off the bat, like, like you know, because obviously I've been comparing The Strain on The Walking Dead on the podcast. I was very excited for The Walking Dead, actually, so that I could, like, since I've been making these comparisons, like, you know, just have some fresh ammo. Um, so I watched the first episode of the season of The Walking Dead, and my overwhelming thought is, oh my god, this episode was so much better than anything on the strain this season that it's not even a conversation. Like it's wow. not like the walking dead is so much better than the strain that I'm actually embarrassed for having uh distant earlier this season. It is. And th now granted, this is the best season yet. Like these first like four or five episodes of the walking dead are like, among the 10 or 12 best episodes the show has ever done. So it's clearly, it's better than it was. Um, but at the same time, there are things that I appreciated about The Walking Dead that I didn't used to appreciate, but having watched The Strain uh, <laughs> struggle so badly with those things, like, I don't know, basic dialogue, um, <laughs> and, and, like, the mechanics of fight scenes and the mechanics of, like, action and and the mechanics of horror, like, just the, the sort of basic, like, like uh, entry-level stuff that The Strain... Uh, had a mixed record with seeing the how good and how professional the walking dead is at that at this point was jarring it wow. it shook me like the like the, the, like i i get i feel bad the walking dead this season just this season is so much better than the strain it's like it's it's it, i'm laughing because it's laughable it's not oh. it's not a comparison it's it's i mean I like if you watch one episode, even not knowing the characters, and I didn't watch like the last half of the fourth season of The Walking Dead, so I came in not knowing anything about the plot. Like Blair, if, if you watch the first episode of the season of The Walking Dead, you'll be like, "Oh yeah, that's way better." <laughs> it's like it's, right. it's like instantly better. It's like it's like it's like you're 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 eating like fast food, and then you go to a nice restaurant, and you're like, "Oh, this is better." <laughs> right. like, it's it's it's, it's self-apparently better. Like I right. think you have to make a case for it. It's so much better, and so. Uh, that kind of shook me to my core. Oh, because oh. Uh, yeah, I, I I've been sort of operating for a few years now under the assumption that The Walking Dead was very popular and not very good, and now it is very popular and very good, and I don't know what to do about that. Well, so. sometimes sometimes dramas fix themselves, and you know they they I mean in the age of the internet, I'm sure that they are aware of the criticism because um, everybody who I respected who uh, watch television, you being namely one of those people, uh, you know, didn't have a great opinion of The Walking Dead yeah. um, in its 
in its later uh, later years. Um, I watched the first season and one episode of The Walking Dead and found everything after episode three of season one to be completely unwatchable. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll try to watch it. Just, uh, just the <laughs> season five premiere. And, okay. and again... It's what what sort of I think helped change my mind is is having watched The Strain because <laughs> it just it's it, again this this show was billed as the Walking Dead killer and so they're, they're a very natural comparison. These Strain vampires behave a lot like the Walking Dead zombies. They move a little faster and they have a little more um uh I guess uh since since there's the master sort of the hive mind whatever you know like they have a little more autonomy I guess but not that much more. They're kind of they have. They have the stingers. They're kind of scarier, I think. Oh, th- there's no question they're scarier. Um, like they're scarier monsters. But it, but it, well, it, Blair, the point of The Walking Dead is the <laughs> the monsters aren't what's scary; it's the people. Yes. Um, and uh, and the, the Walking Dead does people better than the Strain. That's the thing. It's like that's that was our big complaint with the Strain, and certainly what I was hammering all season is the the show doesn't doesn't get humans. And yeah. The Walking Dead, for all of its early struggles, and again in season two, when it was just Rick monologuing, and and they they've sorted it out. Those are people on that show, and just the the way the dialogue moves so effortlessly now, and the way that it doesn't bog down in the quicksand like it used to, is so like eye opening. That like, oh, wow, genre shows can be good, and they they can be premium cable shows. Like the, this this. Oh is a premium cable show, The Walking Dead now. And uh, and I, I didn't think it was ever going to get there. And it did. And now, it by comparison, it really hurts the strain. <laughs> oh. Well, I still... I, I have hope that the strain second season um, will be better. Uh, I don't know that it will ever be The Walking Dead killer. Um, but, you know, I, I, I remember some things from book two that I thought were in book one um, <laughs> that I think will be really exciting when they happen. In yeah, what, uh, I think I can. I mean, it's, it's instructive to note that, by the way, my turnaround on The Walking Dead occurred in season five. So, I mean, I've not liked The Walking Dead for a while now. So, if, if yeah. you know, I it, it to me, it took The Walking Dead a good long while and like four showrunners to finally figure out what it was doing. Um, so, I mean, if if we gave the strain the luxury of like. 80 episodes or whatever, I, I, I bet the strain would figure it out. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's well, not quite fair. Right. But, and the strain has a finite run of show, um, yeah. which is going to be a major difference. We've talked about this before, but um, the strain uh, will not be longer than five seasons um, at most, but it will likely be three seasons. So we, you know, we have a, a much shorter period of time for it to figure itself out. Um, but having listened to the book and it's interesting that it would, make me say that but like I have hope for it again yeah. uh, because I was so if you if you remember our last episode of the podcast I was so disparaged and so unhappy uh, because I just wanted it to be better and there's just I, I have hope I guess again listening to it even though they botched the thing that I listened to <laughs> um, I, I, I have hope that the material is good enough and, I, and the book too is very very strong uh, I don't think cover to cover it's as strong of a of a solid book. It's definitely like a middle mm-hmm. um, book, but it's definitely has a lot more dialogue and a lot more action. So a lot more opportunities for the show to milk things from the book instead of having to sort of figure out a way to create the world without the information that the book gave it. Yeah. And that's, that's heartening. And I, I think, I think the string could definitely settle in as a good show. I think I think that's that's where it needs to get, and it it certainly doesn't need to worry about The Walking Dead anymore. The Walking Dead's already lapped it, it you know, in the race. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't need to. It's it's you know, it started off like with high hopes of sort of capturing the conversation the way The Walking Dead has. That's clearly not uh, not happening. That's never no. going to happen. It j- yeah. it just isn't. So so you know, uh, but abandoning those expectations, I think, uh, will be good for the show. And I, th- I yeah. think it, there's definitely a spot on TV for it. You know, I'm excited for season two. I, I will look forward to it. Um, and I've, I, I too have, have hopes that it'll, it'll, uh, it'll figure itself out. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience since this is 
officially our postmortem. Uh, and unless we find ourselves to be incredibly bored and decide to, uh, not that it's we get bored, but unless we find some content to talk about on the podcast, this will probably be our last podcast uh, for the Strain podcast um, before next season. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I you're know. making me emotional. No. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Yeah. I, do you have any closing thoughts? Oh, gosh. I mean, I I enjoyed this book. Uh, I, I think it's a good book. Uh, I was I was surprised in, in what I think is a good way by um, how not uh, corny it was, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what I thought it was you read, Blair, but I thought it was going to be a lot more like like what True Blood the show is like, I guess. All right, which, again, sorry, everybody. I know this probably doesn't paint a great picture of me, but I'm a huge fan of the Sookie Stockhouse novels. Yeah. Um, they, are, they are light reading. They are not heavy reading. Right. Uh, but they're light reading. But they are, there's a, leer, a linear, clear story. And I think mm -hmm. that the story, again, in those books, I think that there's a lot of things that the show True Blood did really, really well. And that when it found its sweet spot of just sort of being utterly ridiculous it, and just being sort of batshit crazy, like it really, really worked for that show when it just went all in crazy, um, which, the show, which the books never did. The books were not crazy. The books were, were very much just like your standard vampire rom romance novel with more horrific than I would say any of your teen novels, but because there's a lot of scary stuff that happened in them. Um, but so I know that you thought because of my reading of the True Blood books, yeah. uh, that the strain must also uh, <laughs> be, you know, and sort of that light, campy, silly thing. But you know, it's... Pe people read multiple types of fiction. <laughs> no, I, I would say. Um... Oh, this is going to sound mean, but I would say the trait that it shares with those books is that it's also shallow. Um, I would say The Strain is, a, is not the kind of book that would, for example, like cause you to do a deep dive researching something like like the way that like, Game of Thrones does, for example. Like, like it's like you you don't want to get past the surface level of this book. I don't think that there's like an underwebbing of logic here. I think that the, the Strain book is best consumed at taken at face value is what i'll mm -hmm. say like you don't want to like start picking at like oh why does this character do this and why why is the public unaware and why why is nobody posting this like those are questions that you don't want to ask with the strain book no you don't want to go down that rabbit hole no and, and and so i think that this is a a very um uh, it, yeah there, there was interesting it's not because the book i you know i don't think the book is any smarter than the tv show and which makes sense because it's by the same people. But I don't think that there's any more intelligence to the books of the TV show. I just think that there's less of a desire to answer the questions because where the TV show got tripped up is trying to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And and I think that by virtue of the book just sort of doing what it does, which is telling this one story and not worrying about all all the not worrying about making everything work, it kind of avoided the issues that the TV show had when the TV show tried to make things make sense. And they just ended up muddying everything up further. And yeah. so I, I think the book uh, was, I would call it a blissfully unaware book um, that was a, a joy to read and, and a lot of fun. And um, I'm certainly not searching for anything more than face value when I read a book. So, so it's good for me. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think I, I, I overall enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Okay. <laughs> um, do so you think it's it's worth for people who have watched the TV show for them to read the book? A hundred percent. If you have watched the TV show, and again, I am I am the opposite of a book reader. So uh, take it from me. I'm telling you, if you've watched the TV show, do yourself a favor. Go to Audible. Download the Ron Perlman book. They have like like your first book is free. Download it for free. <laughs> And, uh, and you get a free if you get a membership from your Amazon account, you get one free book a month. So God. as soon as you're done with that one, you can get the fall. The there it is. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, if you are not a book person, do what I did. Download the audiobooks. Ron Perlman reading you to, for 13 hours. Are you kidding me? Who? <laughs> it's like an, it's like going to Disneyland. Like why would you? Why would you deprive yourself of Ron Perlman reading a vampire story to you? Honestly, <laughs> how could you not have that in your life? It's like a gourmet meal for your ears. <laughs> yes, are you going back to my restaurant metaphor from earlier? I am, I am, because I love Ron Perlman. I don't yeah. know if you know this, but I'm like a Hellboy super fan. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, uh, he's, he's great, he's amazing, and uh, I just, um, 
I, the audiobook I, to me is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me in our postmortem yeah. of the season uh, with us talking about the books. Um, for our listeners who want to continue catching up with Kyle and I, um, we are doing Monroe's Comfy Sweater this season. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, our, it's our second season of Monroe's Comfy Sweater. It's a knitting podcast. It is a knitting podcast. <laughs> Uh, it's about the te- television show Grimm, uh, which is on its fourth season, but this is our second season of doing the podcast. Uh, we'll be talking about that every week, and uh, we are even snarkier on that podcast than we were on this one. So <laughs> much more snarky. So much more snarky. And we really, really love Grimm. We're both huge Grimm fans. Um, that being said, we don't think that Grimm takes itself that seriously, unlike The Strain, which definitely took itself very seriously. Yes. Uh, so we have fun picking fun at it because, you know, it's something that doesn't seem to mind that. Um, but yeah, you should check out Monroe's Comfy Sweater. Uh, we would love for you guys to be listening to us, especially if you watch Grimm. Um, and you can also, of course, keep up with us on showreadings.tv, um, where we write, uh, reviews and articles about television. Um, Kyle probably posts more feverishly than any of our writers. (laughs) Um, and you should, uh, as we talked about the Walking Dead binge before, you should hang out and come to one of our binges. Um, so the November binge, November 8th, hopefully this podcast gets out before then. On uh, November 8th, we're doing the Walking Dead binge, and we hope to see you there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you so much. We are so happy to have had, you know, all 5,000 plus of you uh, listening every week, writing us letters. You can still, by the way, write us letters. That email account is still up. It's um, thestrainpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can still tweet at us, at the strain pod, um, or at our individual accounts. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, this wraps up our 15th episode of the strain podcast. Before we go, I want to mention a few things. You can download and subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. You can also hear all of our other podcasts at our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Please subscribe to this show and also rate us. Follow the show on Twitter at at the strain pod and Kyle and I at at Kyle loves TV and at Kyle loves TV. I'm sorry. And at Blair loves TV. No, just, so, just message me twice. Yeah. Just message, message him twice. It's fine. Um, <laughs> check out our website, showratings.tv to rate and review the strain when it comes back, as well as all of your other favorite shows throughout the television year. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next year. Aww. Aww.